Hey guys, I'm back with part two of the series on killing giants. If you have not seen part one, it lays the foundation and that video, the link is actually in the description if you want to check that out. I would encourage you to actually watch that one first. Over the next several videos, I want to uh, take you through the giants of David's day and show you just how the enemy works according to the names of these giants, the tactics and agenda uh, of Satan against your life right now, and also the keys to defeating these giants. So today we're going to address the first giant, Goliath. But first, let me give you a little history here. So the nation of Israel, as they were being formed, they were governed by judges, and they wanted to be ruled by kings because they wanted to be like the rest of the world. They wanted to look like everyone else. They wanted to govern like everyone else. And God, through the prophet Samuel, told them, you don't want that. You don't need a king. You have me. And the people consistently said, no, we want a king. We want to look like the other nations. How many times do we do that? So the Lord relented and gave them what they wanted. They, he found this man that looked kingly, that acted kingly that commanded authority and respect just by walking in the room. His name was Saul. So the prophet Samuel anointed Saul to be king, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, and he prophesied. But see, Saul had an issue. It wasn't with his outward appearance. It was with his heart. So Saul was actually a man after his own success, a man after his own gain, a man after his own heart. So he was disobedient to the Lord. Whenever the directions and the instructions of the Lord challenged his pride, challenged his success, challenged the people at looking at him as a good king, he always sided with what he thought would make himself look better, not obedience to the Lord. So God removed his favor from this king named Saul, and he found a man after his own heart, but it just so happened that this man was actually a very young man. There was a boy named David, and he would tend the sheep for his father. And while he was tending sheep, he would fight animals, lions and bears. Matter of fact, well, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a few moments. But I believe... And this is going to be a key in your life. I believe that one of David's most favorite things while tending sheep for his father was to worship the Lord. I see David out here in the fields tending these sheep, just having a praise and worship session. I see him out there going into high praise as he's tending the sheep. I see as he's watering or leading them to the waters, that's, that's when he understands Psalm 23 that he wrote, oh, as you lead me uh, 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 by the still waters. I believe that David was such a worshiper, and that was the key in those moments as a young man. What we do know is that David was a man after God's own heart. David was a a mighty man, but also an humble man. So God removes his favor from Saul, and he tells Samuel, quit whining and crying over Saul. I'm done. He doesn't want to straighten up, and he's not going to change. I've already found someone that is a man after my own heart. I need you to go and anoint him. So he tells him to go to the house of Jesse. He comes to the house of Jesse, and he asks Jesse uh, to see his sons, and he brings out Eliab, this, this um mighty looking man, this one that commands respect, even as a young man, just walking in the room. And the Lord said, that's not him. And so he brought out the next and God said, that's not him. And he brought out the next and God said, that's not him. All the way through all of the sons of Jesse. And the prophet Samuel looked at Jesse and said, do, do you have any other sons? And it's interesting to me because there's there's this uh, a pause right here. Now, Scripture doesn't give us a lot of room uh, as far as to say what that pause is, but there seems to be a pause with Jesse. These are all my sons. He has to be asked, do you have any more? It's almost like he forgot about David. It's almost like David was so insignificant in, in this scheme of things that he thought to himself, not, not that he didn't love David, not that he did not care about David, but there was almost this idea that Jesse himself thought to himself, well, there's no way this could be David. 
he had to be asked, do you have any more sons? After just being asked to bring all of his sons out. And then there's this pause, and Jesse says, well, yeah, there is one more. And about that time, David comes walking up, dirty from the field. And the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, that's my chosen. My point, oftentimes God chooses who everyone else overlooks. If you've ever felt you were overlooked, if you were ever, ever felt that you were uh, less than or did not measure up, unqualified, disqualified, God likes to use those. So on with the story. So David, he's anointed king, and it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. And then sometime later, there's a battle between the Philistines and Israel. So they come to a, the Valley of Elah, and they, they come down to the battle lines, right? And they are fighting. For 40 days, they fight. And the Philistines ha have uh, uh, secured the help of a champion. That's what they call him, their champion. A man, a giant, a Nephilim, half human, half fallen angel, offspring, named Goliath. And Goliath comes down, and twice a day, he begins to taunt the army of Israel. Now, I cannot say for sure what time of day this was, but it's interesting to me that the army of Israel would go into prayer two times a day, and Goliath would come out to taunt them two times a day. I'm not saying those things coincided, but I'm just thinking to myself that Goliath, if he was not coming out during their time of prayer, then that was a missed opportunity on his part. Because at that moment, the army of Israel, all of these fighting men would stop fighting. They would stop doing everything. And they would put their face to the ground and seek the creator of the heavens and the earth. They would seek the face of the one who drew, uh, drove out the inhabitants of the land, of, of the land that they now possess. They would seek the one that parted the Red Sea and, and caused it to collapse down on the Egyptians. They were seeking the one, the only one, that could guarantee their success. And then here comes Goliath and begins to taunt. Why are you praying? Why are you doing that? You know that's not going to help. This is what it is. It's not going to get any better from here. There's not a one of you big enough, bad enough to come challenge me. You know I'm going to kill every one of you. Why are you even standing here? Why don't you just go ahead and give up? See, he was taunting those things at them. Does that not sound familiar in your own mind, those times that you lie in bed at night? The times that you are driving down the road and that oppression hits you and the enemy begins to tell you you're not good enough, you don't measure up, your spouse doesn't love you. Your kids will never change. Your finances are never going to get any better. They're only going to get worse. Your health is declining. Your, your mind is declining. That fog in your mind is not just a fog. It's not warfare. The enemy begins to tell you that you're actually having a mental breakdown. All of these things. See, he begins to taunt, especially in times that we commit to going into prayer. Especially at times when we commit to go into prayer. When do things happen around your life and your, and your home? I bet you Sundays is a popular time. As a minister, I can tell you, there are certain times I get ready for services. There are certain times that I, I, I commit to going into a study and guarantee those are the times that I'm going to be the most interrupted because the enemy doesn't want me in that place. The enemy doesn't want you in that place. So scripture says in 1 Samuel 17, it says that, that Saul and all of his men, all of the fighting men, these valiant warriors that had won wars, they were victors. They were not victims. They were mighty men. And it says all of them were afraid of this giant named Goliath. Literally, this one man, Goliath, this Nephilim, calls the entire nation of Israel, their fighting army, their king, to be paralyzed in fear. 
no forward progress. They came to a halt. There was no future. There was nothing but that moment of paralyzing fear. The name Goliath means splendor. It means massive. He is a representation of fear and intimidation. He is the giant that represents the demonic attack, the spirit of fear and intimidation that comes against God's people. Right now in America, we have a spirit of fear and intimidation that has been launched against our nation. It's actually all across the globe. Right now, there's fear and intimidation because of a virus. There's fear and intimidation because of a vaccine, no matter what side of the vaccine debate you fall on. There's fear and intimidation in our media. There's fear and intimidation in our government. Matter of fact, many pastors out there right now are using fear and intimidation. I will tell you this, be careful who you listen to. The government, government officials, they use fear to stay in power. The media uses fear to stay in profit, and many ministers use fear to stay in position. So be careful of the fear mongering that goes on all around us. Please understand, I don't mean all politicians. I don't mean all forms of media, and I sure don't mean all ministers. But the reality is many, the masses in those groups, they're using fear to their own advantage. Goliath is the representation of fear and intimidation. Matter of fact, right now as a society, we're afraid of each other. I went to a restaurant today, and uh, our governor has passed new mandates effective tomorrow. And I was going through the line at the restaurant and, and this uh, very sweet young lady, she said, I just want to tell you guys tomorrow, when you, if you come, you'll have to wear masks. And I looked at her as polite as I could and said, well, this may be the last time I see you for a while. And she looked at me just shocked. She said, oh, sir, why won't you wear a mask? And I said, because I'm not afraid of your fear. Now, please understand something. You want to wear a mask, by all means, wear a mask. I, I have no problem with that. Me, myself, I choose not to wear one based on the fear that has infiltrated a society. Matter of fact, the mask itself, actually, they, they do bother me because there is a spiritual agenda here. There's a spiritual agenda that the mandates to cover our mouths was released in the very year, the very year called the year of the voice. The very year where many ministers found their voice coming under attack is the very year that they tried to put a mask over our mouths. I find that very interesting. See, the devil, the devil is behind this whole thing. He's behind COVID. He's behind uh, all of the things we see. It is orchestrated by the kingdom of hell. That's not a conspiracy theory. That is a spiritual fact that the kingdom of hell and the kingdom of darkness are at work with all of this. So there's this fear and intimidation because fear and intimidation, this spirit, they require one of two things, submission or death. There is no in-between. Fear demands that you either submit to its torment or kill it. I choose to kill fear. I choose to kill the giant of fear standing in my life. Well, how do we do this? Why would we do this? Because David looked at Goliath. Actually, what happened was Jesse was worried about his son, so he sent David with some supplies. And he said, go find your brothers and check on them for me. So David comes and he hears all the ruckus at the front lines and he, he goes down to the front lines of battle and he finds his brothers and then he sees this giant and he hears the taunts of Goliath and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would come against the army of the living God? See, David, who had been anointed by the prophet Samuel, 
to one day be the king. He had the spirit of God upon him from that day forward, according to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And the spirit of the Lord inside of him rose up and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this dog that he would come against the army of the living God? David wasn't mad for his own sake. If Goliath would have came out and began to taunt against David, oh, I hear there's a kid over there named David. David probably wouldn't even have bothered with it. It probably would have rolled right, right off his back. But when he came against the army of God, he said, who are you? Who are you, you uncircumcised Philistine that would dare come against my God's army? Ooh. See, David was just a young boy while all these other, they were mighty men. They were fighting men. They were soldiers. But David was a boy. But when David heard this, he was enraged and his brothers began to tell him, go away. What are you doing here? All this kind of stuff. And he says, is there not a cause? That word cause is dobar. And it means word. It's actually the same word used in, in Jeremiah chapter one, when the prophet says, the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and he put his dobar in my mouth his prophetic word, his prophetic revelation. So David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a promise of God? Is there not a prophetic word? Is God not the one that drove out our enemies before us to come into the promised land? Is this not the God that gave Caleb the favor and the power and the ability to drive out Anak and the Anakim out of Hebron? Is this not the God that literally parted the Red Sea while Pharaoh and all of his men were drowned? Is this not the God that spoke to Abraham and said, you're going to have a son? You'll be the father of many nations. Is this not the same God that took a, a young man and gave him a dream and didn't forget the dream even while the young man was in a pit in Potiphar's house and in prison, but rose him out of prison and placed him at the right hand of Pharaoh to be second in command of the most powerful nation in the world at the time? David says, is there not a cause? God did all of this to bring our nation right to where it is now. And you think he's going to leave us just because of one giant? So then the word gets to Saul. David goes to Saul and Saul says, well, what are you going to do? David says, I'm going to go kill him. David actually tells him, he says, tell your men, don't be afraid anymore. It's okay. I'm fixing to go kill him. Can you imagine this? This army of these mighty men. And this kid comes up and he tells the king, he says, go tell him, don't, don't worry about it anymore. I'm here. I, I got this, king. King Saul, go tell, go tell your, they're all scared. Go tell your men, stop crying. I, I'm here. It's okay. I'll, I'll take care of it. I'm, 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 I'll go kill him and we can have dinner. Saul says, you're just a kid. How are you going to kill him? And he said, I tend the sheep for my father. And when lions and bears come, notice in scripture, those are plural. That is not a singular term. It is not one lion and one bear. He said, when lions and bears come, I kill them. And if they try to escape, I grab him by the beard and I drag him to the ground and kill him. Oh. Man, this kid tells the king, he says, man, I tried to kill a, a, a lion and he thought he was going to get away from me. King, you should have saw this lion. He thought he had me. He thought he was going to get away, but I grabbed him by the beard. I yanked him back to the ground and I killed him. And so it will be with this giant. And then David comes out. He goes down to the brook and he gets five smooth stones. There's a whole lesson by itself in the smooth stones. Why five? Well, that's interesting. Why would David get five? Some have, have argued that David got five stones because he was afraid he might miss on the first shot. Well, if that were the case, I'm just thinking in, in, in my mind, I wouldn't have got five. I would have been loaded down with stones if I thought I was going to miss. 
I would have been loaded. Matter of fact, if you took me to Iraq, Afghanistan, or one of the places in the world that we uh, are still fighting, and, and you told me that we're fixing to go in and we're going to infiltrate a particular area, and there are 25 combatants in that place, I would not get 25 bullets. Man, I would have every magazine I could carry. I would go to the armory and I would load down. Matter of fact, I would look and go, hey, you got any grenades? <laughs> C4? 50 cal? RPG? I would have wanted to go in fully prepared of anything that was there, anything that might be there, anything that could be there. But David, he picked up five stones. If he was afraid he was going to miss, he would have picked up more than five. If he thought it was going to take more to kill him, he would have got just two or three. He uh, 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 got five because there were five giants left alive. In Genesis chapter 6, the, the uh, giants come on the scene. And they begin to spread so fast, I couldn't keep up with it. So God brought a flood and eradicated them. Sometime later, they came back, but were unable to reproduce at the same rate. By this point of David's day, from, from Joshua and Caleb's day on, they began to eradicate giants throughout the land. And when they got to David's day, there were five of them left. And I think that David went down and he says, God's given me the opportunity. <laughs> I'm not going to kill Goliath just so Lami can come back, just so uh, uh, Sabachi can come back. I think David went down and he says, we're fixing to get rid of the giants. This is not a day to kill a giant. This is the day to kill giants. I think that he had so much faith and so much boldness and so much righteous indignation. He picked up those five stones. He said, I'm coming after all of them. So God, Goliath looks at him and says, what, what am I, a dog that you would come at me with sticks and stones? And David basically says, if you say so. Goliath says, I'm going to kill you right here in front of everybody, and I'm going to let the birds lick up the remains. David says, no. You come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. And I will kill you this day, and the birds will lick up your remains. David had no fear and intimidation. He was literally half the size of this giant he was going up against. And, and with no military experience, he had experience with lions and bears, not with a fighting man, not with a soldier, not with a warrior, not with a killer. So David goes out completely, completely overmatched. Outmatched, outweighed, completely. But he had no fear. Again, Goliath's name means fear and intimidation. The only reason Goliath was able to cripple the nation of Israel was because of fear and intimidation. If they would have went out as a nation, they could have killed Goliath. They could have warred with the Philistines and got victory. But they were afraid because God was waiting for the one that would rise up that wasn't afraid. I believe God is looking at our nation right now. I believe he's looking at the world. I think he's looking at the church and he's looking, waiting for someone that's not afraid to stand up, that still keeps the right heart. I'm not talking about somebody who just wants to get up and fight. I'm talking about someone who retains the right heart and is not afraid, is not intimidated. Matter of fact, we need this in our nation right now. Guarantee oppressors will continue to oppress until someone stops them. That's reality. That's history. The Hitlers and the Stalins of the world, they don't stop on their own accord. Tyranny does not stop. England would have kept on oppressing the colonies had a group of men not signed a declaration declaring we are free. See, Goliath is fear and intimidation. There's a spirit of intimidation and fear coming over our nation. There is a spirit of fear over the younger generation, this millennial generation. I've never seen so many young people fighting anxiety. Uh, I have never seen so many people dealing with uh, anxiety disorders. Please understand, I'm not criticizing those disorders. What I'm saying is that is rooted in a spirit of fear and intimidation. And I've never seen a time where, where fear and intimidation was as prominent or as powerful as it is today. We don't need the fear and intimidation to leave. 
We need a generation of Davids to kill it. Matter of fact, we were praying at the church several weeks ago, and I heard the Lord speak to me very clear. You're about to kill the giant of fear and intimidation. I can't kill it for you, but I can kill it for me. When Satan comes in to bring fear and intimidation against me, I can kill it. I have the right. It's by his power, not my might, but I have the right because he's called me. Because I'm not given to a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7. There's a spirit of fear and intimidation. Matter of fact, I would, I would argue that many of you have experienced irrational fear in the last month, two months, three months. I'm not talking about even the virus. I'm talking about some of you have been dealing with irrational fears about different things, your health, your finances, your children, your spouse, almost like a paranoia, like, like you just know something's about to go wrong or you begin to imagine what's actually happening that's not really happening. You're having fear and anxiety about things that, that you normally do not have fear and anxiety about. It's because there is a spirit trying to attack you to cripple your mind. If you can't tell, I'm a little aggravated over this. It angers me. It angers me that the church is being hit by fear. It angers me that many of you are being hit by fear and intimidation. It angers me when it comes knocking on my door. And believe you me, it comes knocking on my door. I could tell you stories. I won't, but I could tell you stories because I'm trying to keep these videos short, not because I'm ashamed of it, because I'm not ashamed of it. The enemy comes knocking at my door, and it's, it's like the big bag wolf. He, he gets up, and he says, I, I'm, I, he's going to huff and puff, and he's going to blow my house down. Well, no, you're not. My house is not made of straw, and it's not made of sticks. You may huff, you may puff, but all it's going to get you is you're going to be winded when it's done because my house is going to stand. I've told the enemy I will live and not die. I've told the enemy I will succeed and not fail. I've told the enemy what my children would do. I've told the enemy that he couldn't touch my spouse, my wife. Not because it don't get to me at times, but because something rises up on the inside. See, that's what happened to David. Something rose up on the inside. He says, you are not going to come against this army anymore. David's name means beloved. David was a worshiper. Scripture says perfect love cast out fear. The reason I think David was so powerful against Goliath was because his very namesake means beloved. A man after God's own heart. He was so in love with God. He was so enthralled with his love for the Lord that when he heard this giant coming against God's army, it enraged him. Righteous indignation rose up inside of him because he loved what God loved and hated what God hated. And when he stopped, he said, Who are you to come against my God? I mean, David basically... Acted like he was God's protector. I mean, that's not how he looked at it, but he was like, you're talking about my God? How dare you? Don't talk about my, my heavenly father. Man, if the church had that same tenacity today, two-thirds of what's on TV wouldn't be on TV. The church would be throwing a fit. We live in a society where everybody gets their feelings hurt about everything, but it seems like the only people that are censored are those that are Christian. Now, mind you, politically, there's a lot more that are censored. But still, it's the ones fighting for con conservative values, for, for morality. Those are the ones that are censored. If you're demonic and evil and hateful and, and believe in all vile things, you're not going to be censored. They celebrate you. If you believe in Scripture, believe in God. Matter of fact, i got to be careful what I say now. I may get censored for this. That's just reality. Guess what? The church has bowed to the fear and intimidation too long.
You have bowed to the fear and intimidation. I've bowed to the fear and intimidation too long. Enough is enough. It's time to stand. This is my advice to you. David was a worshiper. David's name means beloved. Perfect love cast out fear. I would say this. If you're dealing with fear and intimidation, and if you're not now, then it looks like in the ensuing days you will probably will. Matter of fact, I don't know of anybody right now that has not dealt with some level of fear and intimidation. They're afraid of the shelves being empty. They're afraid of what this virus might do. They're afraid of, of what the vaccine might do. They're afraid of what might uh, happen if you don't have the vaccine. They're afraid of what happens if those without a vaccine gets around them, even though they've had the vaccine. I really don't understand the logic here. Just afraid. Afraid of everything. Afraid if the sun comes up, afraid if the sun doesn't come up, afraid if it rains, it might flood. Afraid if it doesn't rain, we're going to drought. Afraid. Fear. Man, never has our society been so stricken by fear. Even in times of war, even at times that we were about to go into a nuclear holocaust with the Soviet Union, I don't think the fear at that, at that time, I wasn't there, but I don't think the fear overall was as bad as it is now. Irrational fear. So point number one, fall in love with God. I don't mean just get into the Word. I mean fall in love with the Word. I don't mean just pray. I mean fall in love with Jesus. I don't mean just sing and worship. I mean worship. You can sing. So my, my two points are, number one, fall in love with the Lord. Perfect love cast out fear. It's his love. Point number two, worship. 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 I don't mean sing. I mean worship. I don't mean dance. I mean worship. If in your worship time you sing, great. If you dance, great. You shout. Praise God. If you don't shout, praise God. I mean become a worshiper. Begin to love on God. God, I just love you so much. God, you're so good. You're so great. You've blessed me so much. God, I just love you. You begin to fall in love with God. God begins to bring you to a deeper place. And then something supernatural happens because you're anointed. When the anointing of the Lord comes upon you, all of a sudden, mountains become molehills. Giants become ants. See, just the opposite happens without the anointing. All of a sudden, just like it was in Numbers 13, we are grasshoppers in our own sight. The difference is the anointing. Seek the presence of the Lord. There you will be renewed. You will be transformed by the renewing of your minds and empowered by the power of the living God. So that is the end of video two, part two, giant one, Goliath. I want to pray with you for a moment, and I would ask you to go back and, and watch the first video. If you have not, I would ask you to subscribe to our channel and click that bell for notifications so you can be notified when we go live or when we post new videos. And in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours, we will have the third video up in this series. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for this series, Killing Giants. I thank you, Father, Lord, that you have given this word, you've given this revelation, and I ask you, Lord, to anoint the very words that would go through this screen, through this camera, Lord, that would go through the, the, the videos on YouTube. God, I thank you for your anointing, your power, even now that the spirit of fear and intimidation is bound in Jesus' name, that giant of fear, I command you to come down in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the same anointing, for the same fire, for the same indignation that was on King David as a shepherd boy going against Goliath to come upon this generation. Lord, those that are dealing with that spirit of fear, I bind it right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that your people will not bow to the fear and the intimidation. We will not bow to fear and intimidation. We bow our knee to God and God alone. 
Lord, I thank you. Even now, there's freedom coming to those watching this video. Even now, there's freedom coming to those watching this video. Even now, there are those watching this video and you feel that, that heaviness lifting. You feel that oppression. I break it right now in the name of Jesus. And I declare the freedom of Jesus Christ. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I declare the liberty of the Lord in your lives. Matter of fact, say this, say, I repent of fear and I command the fear to leave me in Jesus' name. Because it's not in your power, your might, but by the spirit of the Lord. So Lord, I thank you for your spirit right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Every demonic stronghold break in Jesus' name. Oh, it's not in the name of a man. It's in the name of Messiah, the Son of the living God. In the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ, I command every stronghold to break right now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I pray that you are getting free right now. I pray that the Spirit of the Lord is, is with you, the anointing, the presence of God is with you, and I pray that you just feel chains and shackles are broken. I pray that fear and intimidation is leaving you right now. I pray you are free, 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 free indeed. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching the video. Uh, we should have the next video out either tom uh, uh, tomorrow morning or the next morning. I'm trying to release these in the morning times uh, around 8 o'clock Central Time is when I'm releasing them. Not that that matters because you can catch them on there. But I hope that you will tune in to the next one. And until that, God bless you.